This oral history of museum computing is provided by Howard Besser and was recorded on the 12th of April and the 14th of May, 2021 by Paul Marty and Kathy Jones. I uh, started working as a volunteer for Pacific Film Archive, part of the University Art Museum in Berkeley uh, in 1972. Um, uh, it's now called the Berkeley Art Museum Pacific Film Archive, is slash Pacific Film Archive now. Um, <clears throat> I, um, I was um, uh, doing, th uh, doing things around cataloging the collection, using computers to help catalog the collection. We got a grant from uh, the National Endowment for the Arts specifically for cataloging our Japanese collection. And so I was, I was essentially doing computerized typesetting that would also feed into a, an eventual database. But we had no capabilities of databases. This was, we started that project in about 1970, I'm just, about 77 or so, um, where we were typesetting uh, the uh, records of different films. Um, uh, moving on from there, we um, uh, the 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 administration of the museum saw how kind of sexy that typesetting was uh, on that grant project, and the grant project was paying my salary at the time. Um, so the uh, administration of the museum decided, hey, let's take our regular calendar that we have uh, and let's make a souped up version using computers to typeset the calendar. So we, um, they hired a very expensive designer and I worked with the designer on how we would, um, the designer was only interested in what the, what the calendar looked like. And we went from a weekly to a monthly calendar at that point. Um, but I was interested in us saving the records that we were doing. So at that point in time, Pacific Film Archive was showing about 15 films per week. And there was the, all of the information about the filmmaker, the stars, the date, the, the distribution company, as well as a synopsis of the film. And so we, we, I was interested in saving all of that and making sure that we had that and in such a way that it could enter a database. So I had a, you know, kind of had a very simple user interface where it would ask you title, film title, film date, time, et cetera. Um, and then it would nicely typeset. And the, the interests of the museum were really only the immediate of typesetting and they were not interested in, in saving that, but I was struggling and making it a whole lot more complicated in order to save that material. So um, I, I should also add that at this point, mid seventies, mid to late seventies, uh, I also started getting involved uh, or at least tracking what was being done in similar institutions. So the closest um, in terms of structure to ours was MoMA. MoMA has a film department in a museum. And, and so I was tracking what MoMA was doing. I was dealing with uh, John Gartenberg at MoMA who was a member of the Museum Computer Network in those early days. But I was very dismissive of what they were doing. They were using um, Selgem, Grifos, punch cards. It only gave capital letters. I had been entering all of this from a typesetting point of view, 
where we could have things look very nice and this limitation of only capital letters and doing punch cards just didn't seem very viable to me. I was on a mini computer with a, yeah, 80 characters per card and how, how limiting that was. And I saw everyone there as being really kind of backwards. Um, uh, in, in the, around 1980, there was a meeting of all the film archives to try to develop some type of standards for cataloging their films. Uh, this again was co-sponsored by Library of Congress with, with I believe money from uh, NEA. Um, brought us all together in Washington, though there was no, there was no money to send me there. Uh, I had to foot the bill myself. Uh, my uh, museum wouldn't send me um, or wouldn't pay for it. Um, and out of that grew the National Center for Film uh, Preservation, um, which became um, it to, uh, it, this became an um, umbrella group for records about films in cultural institutions. Um, it wasn't a union catalog. It was more trying, they, they were trying to push what American Film Institute had started in terms of cataloging all the films uh, that had been made in or produced in the United States. So it was oriented towards that, but that operation uh, lasted for uh, about eight years, centered at, uh, it was centered at American Film Institute in LA. Um, and our former uh, NEA program officer, Stephen Gong, uh, became the head of, of that particular project. Um, and I've interacted with him many, many times over the years on different projects. We did a project last year. In fact, he's now uh, head of the Center for Asian American Media that is um, uh, the producer of uh, the Asian Americans um, series on PBS right, right now, screening these days. So, um, so, um, so kind of slowly, I, I became, uh, you know, soon after I started at Pacific Film Archive, once we got this grant, um, I be, uh, this grant to do the Japanese film collection catalog, I became the expert in computers for the art museum. And so uh, I was doing everything from troubleshooting what was on people's desktops to databases to planning and it, it, just a wide variety of things. And I was always on soft money. I was never on, um, on hard money. Um, by the um, early to mid 1980s, probably 1983 or 1984, um, uh, I, I, uh, that was the Reagan era, and uh, the, the, one of the mantras was trickle down economics. Um, so I kind of took that to heart and thought, how are we ever going to get the money to catalog the collection? Let's think big. No one gives people money to catalog collection. They give people money for some large, outrageous, sexy project. So let me propose a large, outrageous, sexy project and the money will trickle down to catalog it. So I wrote a paper, which is since lost, probably around 1984, um, a paper saying, hey, look, we have these facilities in Pacific Film Archive. It's part of the university. We have a mission uh, uh, for the university to help in teaching and education. Well, we have a tremendous program bringing directors to show the premieres of their films. 
we have a tremendous program of older classical films. How about we invite directors to come in with one of their older films, a film that it has been beaten up and destroyed and there are lots of frames missing and lots of scratches on the film. Let us digitize those films, every frame of the film. Let us develop a way to uh, let the director color correct their films, rebalance, uh, clean up scratches and imperfections in the film. And then we can strike a preservation quality print of the film as restored. And we can do all of this using computers. This is 1984, three years after the IBM PC came out. Um, hard drives, the biggest hard drive you could get was 30 megabytes, right? This was not a viable uh, kind of plan. But I laid out the plan. Somehow the paper circulated in various places. And um, by 1985, the, um, uh, there was a new vice chancellor of the University of California, Berkeley, vice chancellor for computing. He, the, the paper happened across his desk. He, he read it, he saw this as his leverage to do what he wanted to do. He wanted, his main project was to build a network linking the buildings on the campus and linking them to other places in the world. So the networking was not really well received at that point in time. He had on his side people in the sciences, particularly physics, who could see the reason for running network wires to build different buildings and having access to material that is not on the campus. But he had no support from the arts or humanities. So he saw these, um, uh, uh, th this paper that I wrote as an angle he could use, hey, film, art, people, people can, everyone can, can relate to that, getting art on your computer screen, getting film on your computer screen, getting it from the museum to classrooms, to researchers, to, to all of this. So he, so we set up a meeting between the assistant director of the museum, myself, and um, this vice chancellor, Ray Neff. And um, the, the, um, the, the assistant director of the museum was a guy who really worked angles. And he was insistent that my office stay at the museum. Um, uh, Ray Neff bought this. He agreed to pay my salary. Um, he assigned two computer programmers to this project. And he tried to lump our project together with another project in um, uh, the uh, geography department that was looking at images, geospatial images and a project in the architecture department that was uh, essentially taking their architecture slide library and converting it to digital. And from our side on the art museum side, we basically gave up the idea of doing this with film, but we decided that we do it with art and, um, and, 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 and art objects. So, we worked on this really hard uh, 1985 in um, we we developed a, a, a system a prototype system where you could do a query across a network um, uh, using simple text fields do a query and get an image that would show up on your screen 
And then we had to build in things like zooming on the image and other things. We had to design it as client server. And the problem with client server is who's gonna install a client on their machine? Um, so we used the only kind of client that was available at the time uh, that would run on a Windows environment or PC environment, uh, an Apple Macintosh environment or a Unix environment, and that was X Windows. So uh, you, you should think of X Windows as being like a web browser is today. It's something that you have to have on your machine in order to view something remotely and everyone has to have one um, or they can't do it. So in the spring of 1986, um, uh, both the American Library Association and the American Association of Museums had their annual meetings in San Francisco. We rented a booth for both of those. We, were, we did all our development work on Sun Microsystems, mi mini computers or uh, high, very ultra high-end workstations. We did all of that. And so we, they had been donating us equipment and they rented our booths at both AAM and ALA conferences. And uh, it was a huge hit. Um, most people at that point in time had never seen a high resolution image on a computer before, uh, on a computer screen, and certainly not on these Sun workstations that were um, about 1500 pixels um, uh, uh, across rather than you know, at, at that point, most computer images were like Pac-Man style or um, like the early Mario Brothers, very blocky, not, uh, you couldn't see any detail. We were showing art images that were really pristine and looked like a photograph. Um, and it, it just became this huge hit. Um, let me backtrack a little bit and tell a, a little anecdote. Um, when, when, as we started into the project, at that point in time, there was not, there were no scanners. Um, there, the, the closest thing you could get to a scanner was a, like a dense, a densometer, a measuring kind of tools for taking um, in, images. Um, so we, the, the very first image I scanned was of an, um, uh, it was a, an oil painting about eight by 10 inches uh, in a frame. Uh, uh, we brought it, I brought it down to um, a digital equipment company office in Palo Alto. And they had just bought a scanner from uh, a company called Iconics that was later bought by Kodak, um, uh, where a camera, a digital camera was mounted on a copy stand. And then you had to have lights at 45 degree angles. And it would um, uh, uh, essentially scan uh, what was on uh, the platform underneath. Um, but this, at this point, these were so primitive that you could not see what you were scanning. You could not see what the camera was seeing. So what you had to do was scan, FTP that file to another computer um, that has display software and then see what you got. So we were do what we had to work out was we would put pencils down on the um, the surface, take an image, FTP it, look at it, and see. Oh, we need to move that pencil in a little bit, or we need to move that pencil out a little bit. And so we we so we figured all that out. We got it to the right 
um, dimensions so that uh, we could uh, it could be right. And we then um, uh, uh, just then took our final scan. The big problem we what turned out to be something that that almost made me give up the whole thing was I had a darkroom thermometer with me. Darkroom thermometers go to about 110 degrees. I put the darkroom thermometer next to the painting and it, it, it the, the scan took about one hour. The scan took about 50 some minutes. And at the end of that scan, the, the, the thermometer had gone off the end of the 110 degrees. So, you know, I was really upset. Uh, I was thinking, at what, what's the temperature at which oil painting oil, the oil in oil painting uh, dissolves? What, at what point does it turn liquid? Um, Luckily, you know, very purposefully, this was a lesser piece in our collection, but from a conservation standpoint, this was not going to work. So, um, so what we ended up doing was playing around with fans and blowing air across the surface of the painting ended up being our way of dealing with it. Um, we still had the problem from a, you know, uh, looking back on it as someone who is now, who has since been very involved with conservation and preservation, this was not a good idea. Um, uh, so we still, so we, we solved the heat problem with fans, but that didn't solve the light problem. This was exposing that painting to a lot of light for uh, 50 some minutes. So that was, that was really hellish. But just, just thinking of how we had to deal with computers and, and scanning before there were scanners is it's kind of astounding um, uh, the difficulties that we had because it, you know we it's it's kind of like early word processors where you would not see you would put in like like word star you put in bracket b word bold faced word and bracket b and you can't really see it the way it's designed to be. That's, that's what we were, yeah, control K, control C. Uh, that way, um, it was such a delay between when we took a scan and when we could see it. And it took so long for the scan that's harmful for the material. So, but luckily over the course of the next year or so, we had, uh, we had real scanners. They were still relatively primitive. They were low resolution scanners. They were, most of them were like the Targa board, um, which basically used a video camera and video technology, but could be very quick. But it was limited to your video aspect ratio of um, 640 by 480. Um, aspect ratio. So you couldn't get a very detailed scan. Anyway, we never got around to doing this um, uh, really sexy thing with uh, moving images, but, um, but this, this became, you know, just a, a big hit. Uh, at some point in maybe 88, uh, late 88 or early 89, the New York Times uh, came out, interviewed me, um, and did the uh, cover story for the Sunday art section on what we were doing. So it 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 just it ended up being you know this really incredible, though very difficult project that was really way 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 ahead of its time. Um, you know this is 1980s. Uh, uh, this is before the web. The first web browser was 1983, and we were doing this in 86, was kind of the big debut of our system. So 
Um, but there was no support on the Berkeley campus for continuing this. Um, the, um, it turned out that the uh, assistant vice chancellor who was heading this project had been cooking the books. He had me, uh, we did, we, uh, the first version of this, we did ourselves. The second version, we hired an outside contractor to work on it. He had me being paid by the outside contractor to kind of uh, hide my salary. And he ended up in it with a multi, multi, multi-million dollar deficit and um, uh, that he had been hiding. And when he was finally caught, he was fired. And, and I got caught up in all of that. I had to uh, have people testify on my behalf that my the only that that I really was a university employee um, uh, when because they fired the outside contractor and they were trying to save money and so the 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 whole thing just fell apart when he left uh, but what remained were serious uh, basic research and development work on all of this. Paul, uh, what? I was just going to jump in and say, I just posted it in the chat, the link to the 1988 oh. New York Times piece oh, that you were cool. just thinking about. And I don't know if I've ever seen this before, Howard, but what I love about this piece is that in this piece, you have an editor at, at the New Criterion, an art critic saying that, that digital reproductions of art is another way to defraud the public, who's the counterpoint in their article to your argument that this is a democratization and helping more people gain access to art. And isn't it wonderful to see that that argument was going on in the New York Times back in the 1980s? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty amazing. But one thing I should add is the reason I got into all of this stuff was both was kind of my head going in two different directions. One direction was, hey, this is great, and think of all the wonderful things we can do. And the other was, well, there's a downside to all of this as well. And that was, uh, I have a piece in probably 1988 or 89 uh, called The Changing Museum, um, where I, I it, it's kind of a, a little bit of taking um, Walter Benjamin's work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction and putting that into the age of digital reproduction. What is the role and him, and I talk about how um, it, it's more, it's democratizing, but it also is something that removes the aura of the original, and there's something about the original. And that, that, that's always been a theme for me from the very beginning is, on the one hand, here's all these cool things. On the other hand, we can't just do the cool things without thinking about what the ultimate uh, ramifications are for it. Um, so yeah, oh, thank you for uh, <laughs> getting that article, cool. Um, so um, let me, uh, okay, uh, yeah, let's, let's continue chronologically. So um, uh, I took a job, so, so things were dissipating on the Berkeley campus. Uh, I didn't really want to go back to my work at the museum uh, on the calendar and on everyone's headache, headaches uh, with their desktop machinery. Um, uh, and I, um, th but through, t through a lot of public speaking and, and um, talking about this project, in various places. Um, I ended up uh, getting to know uh, both David Behrman and Tony Behrman. Uh, Tony was David's wife at the time and she was Dean of the Library School at University of Pittsburgh. And she very heavily recruited me to be a faculty member there. Um, I, finally decided, yes, I'm going to do this, but much more to be able to work with David than to be able to work with Tony. And uh, David, as you know, uh, uh, 
had founded something called Archives and Museum Informatics. And um, he was a leading figure at the time and later founder of Museums in the Web and other, uh, other uh, such things. Um, so I moved to Pittsburgh and, and taught there uh, for three years. Um, my, my closest colleague, my first two years there, um, was a woman named Carla Hayden, who has since become the Librarian of Congress, um, which <laughs> many things in my life that seem, you know, kind of innocuous end up being very important later on. Um, you know, uh, just my, my experience in high school with photography, um, which was just kind of a fun hobby, really helped with my imaging skills and scanning and things like that. So yeah, all the threads that go apart and weave back together. And, you know, there's so many things in, in my life like that. Um, so I worked, um, I worked with David, I taught uh, in Tony's program for three years, continued doing work like this, but I never wanted, I was always clear to them that three years were it. And when it came to the end of the second year, um, faculty kept on telling me, hey, if you ever wanna be a professor, you have to stay here and stay here till you get tenure. And I, I said, that's not me. That's not, I'm, you know, I, I, I moved to Pittsburgh to work with David. I got that work done. Um, it was uh, kind of the ending up and I'm not, I don't care. So maybe I'll never be a professor. I don't care. Um, so I started kind of looking at things that might, uh, that I might do post, um, uh, University of Pittsburgh and um, completely, completely out of the blue came uh, a, a recruitment, uh, a set of recruiters for the Canadian Center for Architecture. Um, the Canadian Center for Architecture is one of the few private museums in Canada um, run at that time very uh, in a very autocratic manner by the richest woman in Canada, Phyllis Lambert, an heir to the Seagram's fortune. And it's a very prestigious museum. It had worked on many standardization um, uh, projects prior to this. Uh, many, many standardization projects with the Getty and with the Canadian uh, um, Research Institute, uh, Canadian Conservation Institute uh, and others. And it was a very, very prestigious museum. So um, they started recruiting me in 1991 um, and um, I went up there to visit. I have, a, I have an, uh, a friend of mine in Montreal that I decided to spend time with while I was up there on my job interview. And my friend is a, a, a performance artist. He's an anarchist. He doesn't think much of rich people. But when I mentioned to him that I'm there to be recruited for Phyllis Lambert, his eyes lit up and he said, She's wonderful. Um, she had saved his housing stock. Um, they were gonna tear down these, this neighborhood that he lived in. And because she's um, uh, uh, this famous architect uh, and has a social view of architecture, she came in and forced the government to uh, take it over and run it as a cooperative. Um, so he thought so much of her. So I thought with his endorsement, I'll go and I'll work at Canadian Center for Architecture. So um, the, 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 um, the reason that they have so heavily recruited me, 
I didn't see the I didn't see their their job description until after I had interviewed. But the reason they had so heavily recruited me was I was probably the only person in the world that would meet their um, requirements for um, who they wanted to hire. They wanted someone with a PhD. Well, that limits pretty far. They wanted someone who could work very well in English and in French. That is more limiting. They wanted someone who could work on integrating the catalogs and metadata in their library, museum, and archive, right? So with all of those, I was probably the only person <laughs> who, who could do it. So, so basically I could, I got to write my job, I, I got to have what I, whatever I wanted, my salary, um, my pen, my um, health plan, um, and you know the way that my contract was written was I could live in Berkeley for nine months out of the year, and they would fly me to Montreal for one week every month of those nine months. Um, and then I had to live in Montreal over the summer. So I didn't have to do Montreal winters except a week at a time. They put me up in a hotel uh, just a block from CCA. Um, so, and I telecommuted the rest of the time. And that allowed me to go back to the Berkeley campus to teach. Um, uh, I taught like one course a semester. Um, on um, image databases. Um, so, um, so I was at CCA and the big project I was to undertake was to join together the catalogs of the archive museum and library. But shortly after I started there, something interfered with this. So at that point, um, their, the, the collection manager on the um, museum collection side was Jennifer Trant, um, who you, you both know. Um, I don't know whether the audience for this knows that, but um, so uh, Jennifer, um, so I worked closely with Jennifer, but Jennifer was also managing uh, another project, uh, uh, which I'll talk about in, in a minute. And at some point, Jennifer dr dropped out of that other project. And at some point, she actually left CCA and moved back with her, uh, her then husband to Toronto. Um, so I got, uh, when Jennifer dropped the project, I got put in a coordinating position for this mammoth project. So here's where I've got like a long, long description. Okay, you ready for this? Okay. Um, 1992 was the 300th, 350th anniversary of the founding of the city of Montreal and the 150th anniversary of the establishment of the country of Canada. Summer of 92 was big, big anniversary time. The Canadian Center for Architecture, CCA, had been working for many, many, many years on an exhibit that would open that summer. The exhibit was called Opening the Gates of 18th Century Montreal. Um, they were planning a really big deal opening with fireworks, the mayor present, the vice premier of Canada, lots of TV coverage. And the centerpiece of this um, exhibit were a set of videos of the three dimensional models of the city of Montreal across the 18th century 
and a kiosk with a, a user interface that allowed people to wander around different areas in a 3D model. So um, the, the exhibit was, um, was trying, among other things, to answer the question, why in the course of the 18th century did Montreal go from uh, a Francophone um, control to Anglophone control? And one of the things that we could do visually was to actually show what was happening in that transition. So we could, we, we could um, with, with, with the visualizations, we could show how over time, the beginning, the, the French were fur trappers, the British were uh, co commercial interests. What we saw was that it was a walled city with, uh, I don't know, 20 gates or so around the city. And what happened was that the, the Anglophones bought up the property around the gates. And so they were buying the furs as soon as the French came back with the furs. And so they became more powerful uh, as the, the, the center of power around the gates and around the transactions that were happening. So we could actually show that visually. So um, the exhibit included um, three minute videos of three dimensional flyovers showing uh, uh, buildings colored in different colors for the French versus the British and how that changed over time. Uh, the fires, the fortifications, all of these were in those three dimensional flyovers. The, 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 uh, the perhaps the most challenging part of this exhibit was this interactive touchscreen kiosk that had three modes for each of the neighborhood, each of three different neighborhoods. We just implemented it in three different neighborhoods. One, one mode was the plan mode um, where the different um, type of use of each building was could be color coded. Was it commercial use? Was it production, service, institutional use? Things like that. Um, so you could, look, you could look at periods of 20 year intervals. If you see at the bottom, okay, so first, um, if, you, if you look at this, the, it says it's the neighborhood is plus to arms. And we have this implemented at intervals of 1693, 1725, uh, 1745, 1785. So you can look at any interval and then you can see uh, what the land use was uh, for the different pieces of land. And then you could touch the screen and it would pop up a menu, it would pop up a window, it would, um, uh, it would fork a, a, a procedure to the database and it would return the name of the owner, uh, the, the type of use it was and whether it was Francophone or Anglophone. So you could touch anywhere and it would just pop this up. Um, so you could look at, you had two modes to look at it. You could look at it in terms of what is the land use and you could look at it in terms of what is the language uh, of, of this. Um, so, um, okay, so that, that's, that's the plan mode. We also had a 3D mode where you could touch the screen and touch the arrows on the screen and kind of like a video game, you could move forward, backwards, turn, move left, move right. Um, and you could see how far apart the buildings were 
and what uh, um, what what the spatial relationships look like. And finally, we had document mode, um, uh, which allowed you to look at building plans and related documents. You could touch the screen and uh, the screen would open a pop-up Zoom window so you could look at the document more closely. Then in the videos had this, you know, with, with the different neighborhoods here, these were the three neighborhoods that we modeled in great detail and allowed the user to, um, to look at. Can you, can you remind me what year this is when you're doing these video flyers? This is 1992, summer of 1992, September 1992. So uh, here you have uh, documents and zooming in. You touch the screen and uh, it zooms in on the document. You get a, a zoom in window. So that's that's basically it. So, so let me let me talk about um, the background to all of this because I think that's really interesting and it's part of what Paul's been talking about about getting to the behind the scenes work. Um, the information gathering for this included 15 to 20 years of pouring through church records of birth and death, building records, property reg registration, planning documents, architectural drawings, all kinds of things. That there, there was 15 to 20 years of work that went into building three different databases to contain this information. So th this is the, the product of a huge amount of work and the vision of Phyllis Lambert, um, the, the museum director, that she could pull off something if she spent all this money and time on people doing very tedious archival research for this. Um, the, um, but let me talk specifically about the, kind, the, the kinds of things that were happening when I started my involvement in this, which was in um, uh, either December of uh, 91 or January of 92. Um, we had entire crews. One crew was the regular exhibition team. Another crew was the research and database team that had been doing all that research and put populating databases. Um, a third crew was the University of Toronto's Center for Landscape Research. They did the 3D modeling. Um, they were, they were essent essentially, uh, the museum paid them to take an application that did some basic 3D landscape modeling and to soup it up and have it work for uh, the museum's purposes. And then they could then take that and market that or, or use that for their own purposes as well. Um, and then a last team was a user interface and labeling team from the Concordia Education, Concordia University Education Department. Um, they were a team that had designed the Metro map for Montreal. And one of their biggest things that they did for us was how can we label something with a word that means roughly the same in English and French? So many of the labels, like what you saw, um, uh, what I showed you a few minutes ago, it, it used the word occupation rather than type of business because occupation is, is not quite the right word, but it's spelled the same way in French and English. 
So we had to struggle a lot with our labeling everywhere for this. So that team helped us with that and with making the three-dimensional uh, uh, video, the, 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 the videos that played uh, constantly. There were two three-minute videos that played in the, um, in the gallery. Um, so what, what did we have to do? We had to integrate these three different databases of information about the properties and the people um, and the buildings. Um, we had to meld the databases to the geographic information system from uh, Center for Landscape Research. We had really expensive ha hardware. We were running a hard hardware that was um, a workstation that's the size of a large piece of luggage. I can show you that too. Um, uh, I have an image of that. Silicon graphic crimson, um, which was um, gr a highly graphic oriented super workstation. Um, it cost us just the one box, the one computer, the size of a piece of luggage cost us a million dollars to buy. Um, we had issues with uh, getting the touch, uh, getting a touch screen, which we got from a, a third party vendor. Um, uh, so we had the, getting the touch screen to work with everything else was another issue. And we also had, uh, we contracted out the building of an enclosure with a fan so it could sit in the gallery. Um, so let, so now let me, let me zoom in to our biggest problem. Our biggest problem ended up emerging on Friday when we were opening the exhibit on Tuesday. On Friday, we finally got the delivery of the enclosure um, four days before. That was quite a bit delayed, but we had spec'd out everything around the enclosure. The enclosure had a fan in it. It had to be exactly the right height so that we could have teenagers, um, uh, as well as adults be able to use the touch screen. We had tested the, the touch screen and they took the measurements of it. So on Friday, four days before the exhibit opened, uh, we put the computer screen the touch sc and the touch screen into the enclosure. Everything fit fine. Um, it was the end of the day. It was, I had to pick up someone at the airport at 5 p.m. And remembering my problem with the initial first scanning many years earlier, I took a darkroom thermometer and I put it in, um, in the enclosure and went to the airport. And luckily, rather than hanging out with the person who I picked up at the airport, I came back, I checked the thermometer and it was, um, it was like about, uh, it was over a hundred degrees. Um, we check, I then checked the documentation that said the computer should never be, uh, never operate above 80 degrees. And here after an hour and a half or so, it was at a um, uh, hundred degrees and I panicked um, and started to, trying to, wrap my brain around this. The only viable solution was to remove the computer from the enclosure and just have the touch screen and the screen in, in the enclosure. But we couldn't put a, four, a million dollar computer in an open gallery, right? You know, someone's going to bump into it. Someone's going to, uh, plus it just wouldn't look nice. So luckily we were on Eastern time and the companies that we were dealing with were on West Coast time. 
So I called both the computer company and the touchscreen company. Um, and even though it was after six our time, they were still uh, people there. Uh, I asked how long the wires could be between the computer and the screen and the computer and the touch screen. And of course they couldn't give me a definitive answer because no one had ever asked that before. Um, but they said it was probably something like 10 to 20 feet. So I found some extra cables and tried, you know, even though I had the touch screen and the computer next to each other, I rolled out cables, about 20 feet of daisy chaining cables together um, and tried some experiments. And um, it was, it, it was, by, by 10 feet or 15 feet, it was already starting to not work. So then I had to go and work with other people in panic mode. We got floor plans for the building and discovered the only possible place to put the computer was in someone's office directly below the gallery. Uh, on this Friday evening, we had to get lots of people involved, yes. Um, we had to drill. We had to get lots of people involved, the director, the assistant directors of the museum, maintenance people, exhibition people, conservators, and even the person in uh, whose office we planned to put the computer. Um, we ordered drilling through the concrete over the weekend, had to have staff there to supervise, obviously. We special ordered single long cables so we weren't daisy chaining these cables um, so that we might get a longer distance uh, uh, between the, um, the um, screen and the um, computer. Um, and we still, so we finally did it. It was okay, but we had another problem, booting the computer because the screen, you, you, it booted with a touch screen. You had to click on things in order to get it to start. And so, but the, the screen was in the gallery and the computer and the mouse were one floor below. So we had to get the security people to borrow their walkie talkies and we were, okay, move the mouse one inch to the right, half an inch up, you know, okay, now click. No, you missed it, down a little bit, click. So we had to boot it that way. And then we, all, we had to end up doing that about once a week, we had to reboot it as well with the walkie talkie. So anyway, that's, that's my big story about difficulty with all of this, so. I love it, and it shows how universal all of these problems are. I, I know I've had similar experiences with technology in cases overheating, and I think Coven Smith told us a fantastic story of something just like that that happened to him at the Met when he was there, right? <laughs> right, so. Uh, it, it's, it's amazing, but you know, the, by far this was the most high pressure kind of thing that I was in uh, because so much, you know, this is 20, 15 to 20 years of research. This is the attention of the entire country uh, on this, you know, the vice premier, the mayor, they had fireworks out in front and a light show by some, some ar um, other artist. Um, just way, way too much pressure to try to make it work, but we did make it work. And that was <laughs> pretty amazing. Okay, so um, Mesel Museum Educational Site Licensing Project um, actually grew out of some efforts that had been percolating a little bit before it. So let me give a little backstory to that. Um, Jeff Samuels um, was a kind of an entrepreneur 
who was a good friend of um, uh, uh, Carl, um, forget Carl's last name. He ran Muse Film and Television. Um, uh, and uh, he had been uh, director of uh, exhibits for the Met. He had been a museum director. Uh, and he formed this company called Muse Television to make um, videos for museums to be showing in the galleries, essentially. Carl Katz, yes, that's right. Did you know that or did you look it up? <laughs> yeah, so, so um, Jeff Samuels was a friend of Carl Katz. He didn't really work for Muse, but he was really interested in what happens when museum objects are shown on a screen. And so he contacted me because of the project I'd been doing at Berkeley. Um, uh, so I probably first communicated with him in around 91 or 92. And he wanted to do all kinds of things. So he, what, what he did accomplish which kind of started leading towards Mesel, was he used Carl, at Carl's clout to get a bunch of art museum directors to come to a, a kind of a focus group. It wasn't as formal as a focus group, but to come to a meeting in New York City where they could show museum images on the screen. I supplied the images, he got a workstation, and these museum directors were kind of astounded at what it's like, you know, because they read about it or heard it, but the quality of the image was uh, striking to them. And um, so Jeff really wanted to do something to kind of um, get over some of their resistance because some of them, some of them had an attitude, well, if we do this and we put our images out there, no one's going to come to the museum. So yeah, right. Well, these were not these were naive kind of notions that people had at the time and no one really knew. And so Jeff really started pushing hard for trying to do something to try to assuage the um, the resistance from some of these uh, art museum directors. Um, so that led to that, plus some things that had been happening in, in uh, Getty AHIP, the Art History Information Program. Um, right around then, Jennifer Trant had left um, the Center for Canadian Architecture, where I was. Um, um, where she and I were both working together. And she went to work as a kind of program officer uh, at Getty Ahib. And she was uh, in charge of all things imaging, but there wasn't much there. So she made a contract with me to write the book, Introduction to Imaging. So that contract probably happened around 1993 and it was published in 95. Um, but she, she also didn't have a whole lot of other things to, to do to take up her time. So uh, I, think, I think some influence, the other, the other influential thing was that what, would, what was happening at AHIP then was Michael Esther left to form Luna Imaging with Getty money for support. So they were doing uh, high quality imaging for museums. And Eleanor Fink replaced him as head of Getty AHIP. And Eleanor had been, um, we'd kind of been pushing her to get more involved in other communities than the straight museum community. And she was very interested in the educational community. So we brought her to a meeting of the Coalition for Networked Information, which is Cliff Lynch's organization. But back then it was really Paul Peter's organization. Um, but Cliff, Cliff was uh, very active in it. He, he didn't become director till the late 90s when Paul died. Um, 
So we had the CNI meets twice a year, and we had a couple of sessions around what the educational community could do with the museum community. And out of that came this idea around 1993 of can we get how can we actually show how the educational community might be using images from museums? So we we came up with the idea of Mesel. Mesel was, was really poorly named because it really had very little to do with site licensing, nor did it have much to do with intellectual property issues at all. It was really a um, proof of concept on how you could get um, uh, images and rich metadata from um, seven different repositories, six museums and the Library of Congress, how you could aggregate all of that uh, into one data set because everyone had different metadata, everyone had different standards for their images, how could we aggregate all of that into one data set, which we did and created uh, about 10,000 images? And then how you could deploy that in a university environment. And we had seven universities who each had their own user interface, had their own kind of mapping of metadata, uh, had their own search systems, had their own display devices, had their own um, uh, viewer image viewers and image displayers, things like that. And, and so how could we deploy this? So the, um, the project was a very elaborate one. Uh, it involved 14 different institutions, seven collections and seven universities. Uh, when we had meetings, which we had at least twice a year, we had meetings of at least two representatives from each organization, usually a technical person and a metadata person, or uh, occasionally we also had faculty who came, art history faculty who taught with these images. Um, but that meant that we had 7, 14, 28, a minimum of 28 people at each of these meetings. And um, there was a steering committee. The steering committee consisted of uh, myself and Cliff Lynch, uh, ostensibly representing the educational community, and David Behrman and Max Anderson, essentially representing the museum community. Though Max, Max was not hugely involved on an ongoing basis. Max didn't really come to our regular meetings, but Max was someone who was really critical in arm twisting or getting muse other museum directors to make this uh, into a priority. So he, he wasn't involved in the actual ongoing management administration functions, but he was really critical at certain points uh, intervening and um, trying to make things happen. Um, so uh, we, uh, we put out a call for papers. I've, I've actually gone back and looked at dates um, <laughs> and I had to look at, the, the, I gave, uh, my papers regarding Mesel, so I think 17 boxes of papers to the Getty Research Institute. So I had to look at the finding aid uh, this morning to get some dates. So in 1994, we uh, early 1994, we put out a call for proposals for museums or universities that were interested. And we, we also, of course, did a lot of word of mouth. And then uh, later in 94, we met in uh, one of the Disney hotels in Orlando, um, where um, the four of us on the management committee, plus Jeff Samuels, plus uh, Jennifer Trant, 
representing uh, the, the, the Getty and who were funding this, uh, we all met to go over proposals from like 20 or 25 museums and the same number of universities. And we met to decide who would, um, who we would choose. And, he, and actually Max's role really came out there because at one point we were looking at the, um, the application for the Houston Museum of Fine Art. And we were really concerned about something in their application. So he went to the phone, called his office, got someone to look in his Rolodex, and he called the director of that museum and asked him and kind of pressured him into making sure that they could indeed perform what, what we were uh, expecting them to perform. So that's just a sample of kind of how Max um, really uh, worked on, on this, but he wasn't involved in the kind of day-to-day -day stuff. So Mesel went uh, on from um, about 1994 to about 1998. Um, in 1995, we did an application to the Mellon Foundation. Um, and at that point, the Mellon Foundation was dominated by economists. Um, uh, the uh, head was an economist. Most of the program officers were economists. And so they, we, when we started talking to them about funding a study of Mesel, they were interested in not so much in how would a future use of this material be? How would some future infrastructure for distributing museum uh, images and rich metadata to universities or even the pu public? They weren't interested in, they weren't as interested in the mechanistic parts of that as they were interested in a business model to make it work or, um, you know, uh, how, how much it would cost to do. They were more interested in those things. And that was a constant tension between the team. Um, so I, uh, they, the, um, back up, Mellon gave us money, gave us uh, a, a healthy sum of money to evaluate um, Mesel with an eye towards putting something like that into place. But they were constantly pushing us to focus on cost, and we were more interested in the mechanistic part of that. And so um, I had a team, uh, the, the money, the Mesel money came to me at Berkeley. I was at Berkeley at that point, uh, came to me at Berkeley, and I hired a whole team of people. I hired a postdoc uh, uh, full-time, and... Um, three to 20 hour a week students for a couple of years to work on, on, on this. And we came out with uh, an evaluation that uh, on, of the cost and use of digital images online, uh, which is still up somewhere available on the web. And that became a planning model for Mellon's eventual service um, uh, that they um, uh, created called Art Store. But in the meantime, towards the end of Mesel, before it broke up, the, 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 the agreement was that it would last till 1998. And everyone, when we got to about 1996 or 1997, everyone was worried about what was going to happen in 1998 when the contracts were up and would all the museums continue to let these universities use them? Would they want to charge for them? What would happen? And at that point, um, about 97, I would say, um, David Behrman started working on what became Amico and plotting out how Amico would work. So. The core for Amico came from the museum side of Mesel, not and 
the there was no involvement from the university participants at Mesel. They were just so they it was David's belief that the only way to try to make it work was for museums to make decisions totally on their own and kind of hope that the universities would go go along with paying for it. Um, he thought it was going to be too difficult if the universities uh, got involved uh, on the early stage, because he was very afraid that even though the six museums and Library of Congress that contributed to Mesel or that were participants in Mesel, even though all of those people were on board with something like Amico, he didn't think that it would grow. He didn't think that they could convince other museums unless they had conversations and decision making totally on the museum side. Uh, one of the interesting things that we found as we were um, uh, doing Mesel was originally we all decided, we, met, we came up with a decision that we would have a, a one file format and then everyone would use lossless JPEG as their file format for all the images. But about six months into that, one of the people, someone, the technical, uh, the IT person from the National Gallery of Art started doing some experiments with some of the software. There was not much software available for scanning or anything back then, not much hardware or software. Um, he did an experiment where he did a lossless, he saved a file in lossless JPEG um, or converted a file into lossless JPEG and then took, compared that to the original file. And he found that there, it was lossy. So that the, the, this, I don't remember who the software was, but this was the main software that people were using uh, to create lossless JPEG was lying about what it was really creating. There was, it was not creating lossless JPEG. So there were lots of little things like that that we discovered. All of this was early on. Another thing that we discovered, so the project started in 1994. The first web browser was released in May of 1993. So it was not clear that the web would be this universal um, um, uh, interface for people. It wasn't clear at the time that we started that that would happen. And so a couple of the universities started out to deploy things not on a web browser. And one of those universities switched to a web browser like a year later and had to re-architect everything. But the, uh, the only university that stayed with a, web, with a non-web browser approach was the University of Maryland. And they, uh, they continued and I think they converted to a web browser probably around 1998, near the end of the project. Um, so the project allowed us to look at a whole lot of different things, we'll look at crosswalks in terms of, we, we created our own uh, data dictionary and a set of fields uh, uh, that were wider than a core. You know, it was much wider than, well, Dublin, well, the other thing, Dublin core was, uh, first meeting of Dublin Core and the creation of Dublin Core was March of 95. So we were starting before Dublin Core started, but we had the advantage of all the great vocabulary work that the Getty had done uh, in like the cataloging description of works of art, art and architecture, thesaurus. Um, a lot of those uh, we had uh, the advantage, as well as some work that had gone on in uh, CDOC um, uh, uh, and other international groups. So, uh, we, uh, so we created a, a data dictionary and a set of, I think it was maybe 30 fields, 
something like that. And each uni each university had, or I'm sorry, each museum had to map their metadata into those fields. And then what was really interesting was how the universities then mapped those 30 some fields to queries for that their users would make because most of them had simple queries and complex queries. Now, this is before Google. This is not, you know, this is a world where you, do, you know, today's world, we expect that a query is typing in text into a little box and you just type in a few words and that's a query. That wasn't clearly uh, 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 widespread. People didn't really think that that was, that people would do that back then. We had these elaborate query systems with pull down menus, like artist equals, you know, you pull down a list of artists or uh, you have a pull down menu with a list of the artists or you type in in a field artist name or you type in another field, the title or things like that. So everyone had different user interfaces and everyone mapped their metadata fields differently. So you might have, um, they may have expectations of two or three different fields coming up when you have, you know, uh, uh, something, you know, you might, you might be combining things like prints and photographs or some, some things like that. Those fields might be mapped together and so what it what it meant, and I did a paper on this called something like uh, if 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 the uh, if the data is the same, why do I get different answers or something like that? Um, where where I could go to different you know the, the same ten thousand images in each university, I could do a query at one university and get one set of hits and do a query at another university and get a completely different set of hits. And that was totally because of how the universities mapped some of the 30 fields into something. Yeah, the museum's data is the same. Why does this look different? Yeah. Just uh, talking about uh, other things, um, you know, Getty, Getty Ahip, um, continued to really kind of lead the way in uh, standards for the art world and in trying to make things happen. Uh, again, uh, you know, I think Eleanor Fink had a, um, a real good uh, vision of where things were headed and uh, deployed Getty money to do some very important things. So the, after my uh, intro to imaging book uh, was wildly popular, she commissioned an introduction to metadata and then a series of other introduction to books um, that I think had a lot of impact on, uh, on, on, on growing the field of people involved in, um, in uh, trying to uh, deploy um, museum type collections or art historical type collections uh, to a, a, a wider environment and, and both to museums and to universities and to the public in general. So I think, um, I, I think Getty Ahip really had just a critical role in doing this. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they did. They did so many things that really moved the field ahead. And it was really a shame that how things, you know, they, they changed the name from the Getty Art History Information Program to the Getty Information Institute. And then maybe a couple of years after that, uh, they folded it and moved the vocabulary uh, uh, areas uh, into the Getty Research Institute. Um, but, um, you know, I was on contract for the Getty to write the book 
intro to imaging for a couple of years. And then I was on contract to them periodically for smaller projects after that. Um, uh, we did we did a project in 1998 that's worth mentioning. Um, it, uh, it was co-sponsored by the Getty Conservation Institute and the Getty Information Institute. It was called Time and Bits, colon, Managing Digital Continuity. And it was an attempt to get leading thinkers together for three days to look at the problems of preservation of uh, um, art historical uh, works uh, over time. And so the people invited to that were in included Brian Eno as an artist who does experimental music, um, uh, the uh, editor of Wired Magazine, uh, uh, Brewster Kale, who was founder of the Internet Archive, which was brand new then. He actually brought it in to show us, <laughs> show us the machine. It was it was a small machine. This was like a year and a half after um, they, for, he first started it. Stuart Brand was the convener for it. So he was master of ceremonies or uh, chair or whatever. So the, it was a, a, an interesting group of people, Jaron Lanier, um, uh, really interesting uh, group of people, but the technology people were more were focused kind of in the wrong uh, area of digital preservation. They were looking at trying to in inscribe something in titanium that will last for a long time. So that the actual the end results that that everyone could agree on were very limited. But the discussions over those three days were really interesting. The first two and a half days were discussions just amongst the group of about uh, 14 people. Um, uh, but the last half day was open to the public where we presented our findings and, and uh, lots of other people in the field. By the public, I don't mean people who go to museums. I mean people who are in people who work in the field uh, participated in that last half day. Um, but the proceedings of it are really interesting. There's a book uh, uh, that was generated from the proceedings um, and the ideas that came out, there's lots of uh, interesting things. One of the stories I, I recount uh, pretty frequently is Jaron Lanier's story of his early video game and how the computer museum had wanted to, uh, the computer museum then in Boston, uh, had wanted to do an exhibit on video games and asked him to bring his game. His game, he, he had the game on a cartridge, but he didn't have a TRS-80. Uh, they got him a TRS-80. Uh, they managed to find that. But then the joystick, that they found was a joystick from a later version of the TRS-80 and it wouldn't run. So the game couldn't run, not because of, um, uh, because they didn't have the hardware, but because, be, not because they didn't have the computer, because they didn't have the right joystick. So anyway, just it, it illustrated some of the difficulties there's lots of little stories like that from um, uh, from time and bits that are um, interesting to to go to. Oh, there is one more thing I wanted to say sure. uh, uh, and not get lost in this, and that's um, what what was what I felt was a real turning point in museum computing was the MCN meeting in New Orleans whenever that was, that, that, that had to be late 80s or early 90s, 86, yeah. That was, a, that was a turning point in terms of 
you, we had vendors who were seeing like uh, the idea that you wouldn't have to have a mainframe computer to do this. There were vendors doing things on workstations. Yeah, Chuck was instrumental in putting together that meeting. And another person instrumental in that meeting was Lenore Sarenson. Lenore was a vendor, Willoughby Associates, and she was on the board. She was on the MCN board. And she's the one who convinced me to go. Uh, she paid my way herself, not, not MCN, but herself. Um, and, I, you know, I think, I think particularly her amongst vendors uh, were instrumental in, in um, working on and developing standards for the museum community. Um, uh, and, you know, it made sense from a business perspective for her. Uh, I don't know that the other vendors really saw it right at the beginning, but if, if, if museums agree on, um, yeah, um, if, if museums agree on what, what their vocabulary standards are, then they can, then the same piece of software can be sold to multiple museums. So it does make sense from a vendor standpoint. They don't have to, because before that they had to retool each of their products for each new customer, for each new museum. So, um, so Lenore, I think, was really instrumental in that. And, um, and she was very involved in vocabulary. And people who worked for her, um, there were at least two people who went on to uh, work in uh, and do really fundamental work in um, museum vocabulary kind of activities. Yeah, uh, yeah, Jane is one. Um, trying to remember the name of some of the others. But there, you know, there, there, the, the, the vendors, you know, that, that, that MCN meeting was just, I think, really, really set the stage for, in a way, you could say there was MCN before that meeting and there was MCN after. And then MCN after was much more populist, much more doable, um, much more affordable. Um, that the solutions and the, um, it, it, it felt like this was opening up MCN to a much broader, broader constituency.